Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to a special Election 2016 edition of L'Chaim to review and analyze some of the more striking issues in this year's primaries. I'm most pleased to be joined by two of American Jewry's most thoughtful individuals who often share their perspectives on issues of the day with us. Thane Rosenbaum is the director of the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society at NYU Law School, as well as being an award-winning novelist and commentator on Jewish life, and Thane's most recent novel is entitled, How Sweet It Is. And Eric Yaffe is President Emeritus of the Union for Reform Judaism and a columnist for Haaretz. And Eric is a frequent guest lecturer to Jewish groups around the country. And Eric's website is simply ericyaffe.com. It is lovely to be sitting at this table with you. Thank you both for coming in. Good to be here. Um, I want to first set the stage for where we are in the primaries, and I want to put some numbers up on the screen, beginning with the Democratic side. Hillary Clinton won eight of the 12 primaries on Super Tuesday pretty decisively, and you see the delegate count there. Hillary now stands at 979, Bernie Sanders at 382. Um, Many people think that the Democratic primary is basically over and that how long it takes is a question, but in the end, everybody pretty much agrees that Hillary Clinton will be the Democratic nominee for president. Do either of you disagree? No. No. Okay. Um, spend one moment on what we experienced in the Bernie Sanders phenomenon. First of all, did Bernie Sanders at all tickle either the imagination of either of you. Eric? I admire Mavericks on both sides. Yes. And uh, he was a Maverick. He began with 3% uh, support in the polls, and he ended up doing very respectably. And he pushed some tough issues. I think he had an impact on Hillary's campaign. And he'll end up having an impact. He'll have 1,000 delegates, I suspect, at the convention. And uh, I think Hillary will have to pay some attention to his views and how she uh, formulates her own platform. You know, there's a progressive movement in the United States that is not all that self-identified, but it's there. It, and it, it's very resonant. And you saw it over the last eight years in Occupy Wall Street. You see it very much on college campuses. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and you saw it with Bernie Sanders. Uh, and I think even the number of people who identify themselves on the progressive left who voted for Barack Obama twice felt disappointed by Barack Obama twice. Uh, and so that, that too fed that progressive agenda. And because Hillary Clinton is always seen as centrist, she did work in the Obama administration, she comes from the culture of triangulation, which her husband invented in 1992, there were many, many people on the Democratic side who just felt, I can't vote for Hillary. I have to vote for the only progressive on the ballot. And that was, that was Sanders. Forgive me, what does many mean? You know, it's hard to say. You know, many means that it had the same kind of loudness as we see with Trump. The numbers probably aren't that large. Uh, but it's whatever the number is, it's a, it's a good number of that number, meaning that they speak loudly, and you saw the cheering on co college campuses. You know, college campuses, university pl campuses, we've seen even when it comes to hate speech and safe zones and trigger warnings, it's its own community, it's its own culture. Okay, but that seems to be a very small slice of the Democratic Party and the Democratic electorate. Yes or no? I mean, Bernie Sanders won New Hampshire. He, was, he did surprisingly well in Iowa. And in the South, he, by his own admission, was decimated. And those are Democratic voters voting. 
the African American community seems to be enormously behind Hillary Clinton. And for a while in New Hampshire, some young African Americans voted for, uh, for Sanders, and so was that going to go anywhere? But the reality is, it seems, that the vast, vast Democratic electorate um, may appreciate, as you do, Bernie Sanders. They're not going to vote for him. Look, his, his overall numbers among Democrats uh, were as high as 40%. Uh, those are very respectable numbers, but not enough to win. And not, I, in, not in the South. He got no uh, not in the South. Not in the South. And obviously among uh, African Americans, he had virtually no support. He did not do well among minorities and among minorities that might be expected to be sympathetic and to his message. And why do you think that is? I think it has to do with 25 years of, of public service by Hillary Clinton and by her husband. <laughs> and Bill created uh, this visceral tie with African Americans. I think it, it was real. It was based on where he grew up and how he related to that community. I think it carried over to, to Hillary, who cultivated it. And I think Bernie was just helpless in trying to, to uh, change that. Well, the numbers, as Eric is citing, is, is, are right. But if we, had fact, if we took out of the equation Hillary's email problem, um, because there were people who were voting for, for Sanders who weren't even progressive. They just were concerned about the email problem with this thing. Res how real is the email problem? I don't think it's, I don't think it's a problem. How, pro how, re how real is it? A minor problem. OK. Um, minor to in what extent? It was a mistake on her part. I don't believe it will ultimately be decisive in the election. People will be tired of it, and we'll put it behind us and move on. Do you I think she'll be indicted? No, I don't. Do you think she'll be indicted? I do not. I do not also. By the way, you know, we're not prophets, but that's the three of us agree here. Um, it may be troubling, and it may be a mistake. I don't think she's going to be indicted, despite the number of FBI agents who are involved in the case. Um, but what you are saying is, and we've seen this in the polls, she isn't trusted. And one of the reasons why she's not trusted is the way in which the email story has been front and center in an honest way. And so what you're saying is there are people who voted for Bernie Sanders also because they were rejecting Hillary Clinton. And they, they, I meet people all the time, by the way. I don't know if you go. I meet people all the time, Democrats, who say to me, I'm very upset with Hillary Clinton. And, and they're not progressives. Right. Right. So I'm saying that his progressive numbers are also skewed because we can't tell from that uh, how many of those people are just concerned that Hillary, in the end, will be bogged down with this email scandal or they don't trust her for any number of reasons. Look, the reality is she's the only grown up in the room uh, and everybody sees that. And I think that that's why these states now, whatever flirtation people had with Bernie Sanders, I think that's over. And I think Trump helps her because the more absurd the Republican circus looks, the more necessary it is to let a grown-up uh, be the standard bearer. Bernie Sanders is not a grown-up? I think Bernie Sanders is a grown-up, but he's a socialist, and America does not elect socialists <laughs> to the presidency. And then what is it that you feel Bernie Sanders has said which may resonate with the Democratic Party and force Hillary Clinton to move I guess, further to the left. Look, the American people are angry. Yes. They're very angry. Yes. They're angry at, at the leadership of their country. They're angry at both parties. Yes. Um, they're angry at the economic situation. They're angry at our dysfunctional government. And as a result, on both sides of the partisan divide, we have, con we have uh, candidates, mavericks, who are taking advantage of that anger. In many cases, the support has nothing to do with the specifics of what the candidate may be saying. But it's an expression of the profound unhappiness with the way things are, are going in America. And I, I think that, that explains a lot about uh, Bernie Sanders and, for that matter, a lot about uh, uh, Donald Trump. I think you're absolutely right. You agree? Profound anger, profound sadness. I, I agree with Eric as, as usual. <laughs> as usual. But I think it's also more concrete than that. I think that um, Sanders did two things that tapped into a kind of zeitgeist, a psyche of the American anger. One is income inequality. Uh, and so Hillary Clinton's associations, flirtations with Wall Street, 
her speeches at Goldman Sachs, all of a sudden this became a huge issue. Why? Because she was connected to bankers. Uh, and Sanders can claim, as a socialist from Vermont, the only rich guys he knows is Ben and Jerry's. He doesn't know rich guys. And so therefore he was able to, certainly on university campuses, uh, tap into this idea that this is, a, uh, this is part of this American anger is in income inequality. The second area is America's wars. You know, Sanders presented himself in running against a secretary of state as saying, I am not promiscuous when it comes to America's military. I don't think we should be involved in anything. I'm a Jew, and I don't think we should be involved in the Middle East, right? And I think that that gave him an enormous amount of credibility within the uh, progressive community mm -hmm. because he's saying, here are the two things that you want to hear. You want to hear that there are too many rich white guys around, and we have to stop this in income inequality. And secondly, uh, that America is just constantly thinking that they have to fight the world's battles and put boots on the ground. And I don't believe in boots on the ground, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. um, could Bernie Sanders as president reform Wall Street? Is that what a president can do? I do think that the president uh, can do things about Wall Street, so the, about the specifics of Wall Street. I think Dodd-Frank made a difference. But that wasn't a president. You had to get Congress to agree. That's true. But President Obama played a role. The notion that he President had, he Obama was, he was played a now, leadership role. He played but a leadership he, role. You but need he to, couldn't do it if Congress did not want to go along with it. Well, the I notion, think. one of the things that, that bothers me about mm -hmm. the way in which the media is covering the presidential primaries is that there seems to be a suggestion or candidates are being permitted to say, if I'm elected on the first day in office, I'm going to abolish Obamacare. On the first day in office, can any president abolish not Obamacare? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I mentioned before the dysfunctional nature of our government is an important part of the political picture now, and it's an important part of what people are okay, angry about. And I'm about. suggesting the media is complicit. I agree and with I think that. People hate the media. And what, I mean, people are angry about the fact that our government, in fact, can't do anything. Mm -hmm. and part of it is is structural. And part of it has to do with the particular leadership that we have in our parties at the moment. But you're absolutely right. Uh, the likelihood is that whoever is elected president, <laughs> sadly, tragically, little will get done and that uh, th that anger will simply uh, deepen. And uh, Eric, are you angry? Uh, yes, I share that anger. Thane, are you angry? I'm what everyone else is, shockingly frustrated about how paralyzed our government appears how incapable our government appears to be able to do anything. And I think that what we're seeing now, Sanders, certainly with Trump, is the, the aftermath of eight years in which the Republican Party, largely because of the t influence of the Tea Party, became an obstructionist party of the no, and a president who really had no clue on how guys like Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson did, took care of business. Mm -hmm. Here's a guy, I remember oh, I- you voted for him twice. Uh, you know, I, I, I voted for him the second time. <laughs> <laughs> I was not, unlike Donald Trump, even as a longtime Democrat, I was simply unable to vote against someone who had been a prisoner of war. I simply was unable to vote against. Uh, Interesting. Not, even in that, I felt that Obama was incredibly, again, I'm a progressive, I'm a Democrat, but I thought he was unbelievably inexperienced. And it seemed... By the way, he was. He was, unbelievably. And it was shocking to me that a guy who had no legislation, the only thing he ever wrote about was his father, uh, you know, had been carried all this way. And I just, I just couldn't do it as much as I wanted a black president. Mm -hmm. I wanted And I was, even after he won, I was so happy for him. But I could not vote against a man who was a prisoner okay. of war. I am livid at all of them. I think they're all bums which puts me in a very difficult position because I believe you should vote. And the question is, so am I once again going to do what so many Americans do? I go and vote for the least objectionable. But I, I at the moment, I don't believe them. I, and I think that also is why Donald Trump has, is a phenomenon that is so shocking to all of the pros. The professional pundits, all thought he was going to disappear in a moment. 
And he hasn't disappeared, and we'll talk about him in a moment in detail. But I think one of the reasons why is that people believe he's different. And there's only one thing we want. We don't want the same thing anymore. None of the others are different. They're all in the game. And Trump plays by totally different rules. And it may be, talk about inexperience. By the way, Cruz and Rubio are in the same position that Barack Obama was in. Right, first term senators. First, and they're taken seriously just as Obama was taken seriously. It's just shocking to me. It's a terrible, anyway, it's a terrible president. I'm, I'm I acknowledging agree. I am angry, again, for journalistic integrity. Mm -hmm. um, we should know where you stand in terms of your own leanings left, right. Um, you, know, you are well known in the Jewish community. We're assuming that you have, you, you, conti you continue to support the Democratic candidates. Is that fair to say? I'm center left in political orientation. Uh, I mostly vote Democratic, not always. If I were voting now, I would, would undoubtedly be voting for Hillary Clinton based on the information I have in front of me. Fair. And you? I'm always center left and oftentimes even left of center left, except when it comes to terrorism and national security, in which I'm, you know, unbelievably neoconservative, mm -hmm. uh, and I have been for years. But I'm a, you know, uh, old, uh, old school liberal. Okay. Does, is there anything self-contradictory in the way Thane describes himself? Not in terms of his personal views. The problem is the political world doesn't tend to line up that way. And, Eric's um, right. Uh, so, you know, therefore that's a problem what do you for mean him. Eric's right? How is Eric right? Because there's, there's no great candidate for me in that regard. I mean, I couldn't, you know, I believe in a lot of the Sanders progressive agenda, but the rest of him is a disaster for me. So he's un for me, he's unvotable. I was working with Jeb, <laughs> I was involved with the Jeb Bush campaign okay, I want everybody to from the beginning. But, but Fane I, Rosenbaum. This is true. <laughs> was supporting Jeb Bush until Jeb Bush dropped out. Yeah. Where's, the, where's the center left part <laughs> is, is the question. I was, I was with Jeb from, the very, from literally day one. Why? Well, you know, I know him. And that helps. Uh, I knew him, a man of incredible. That you hosted him at the Y. I did. I've known him for years, and I've hosted him at the Y. And I, and I thought that this was the in, the epitome of a mensch. And I think we lost somebody, especially in this the incivility and the indecency of this election. Uh, we, oh, wait, I was shocked. I was sure Jeb was going to be the nominee. I, it was an unimaginable. I, I all of us did. All of us were shocked that. The uh, people, the people that worked closely with him, like myself, that he pulled out after South Carolina. Yes, I uh, mean, we all thought he was going to at least run the table. Of as course, we had, the, we had the money. The right to rise had the funds. Uh, he I was a terrible candidate. Yeah. <laughs> Look, he, he was a terrible candidate. You know, he, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln would have been a terrible <laughs> candidate in this kind of an election. It's not clear what is good. By the way, what made him a terrible candidate? I yeah. watched him. He had, he, and I agree with many, you on this. many of them have had good debates and bad debates. He had some good debates. He had some bad debates. I don't think he was a terrible candidate. I don't think he ever articulated clearly what exactly it was that he believed in. Trump targeted him precisely because he was a front runner, and he was totally at a loss in uh, deciding how to respond. Well, that's a different point. That and is, Bowie, that's correct, that's, and, and it is a different that's point. A different that's, point. Very, that's not a we, terrible candidate. In we fact, it, we you, want a president who can take care of himself. No, we want a <laughs> president. You've got to sit in the room with Putin. So, no. I mean, you know, you've got to be able to respond, <laughs> and somebody comes after you. Well, he was unable to respond. But we're, it was, you're uh, buying into all the premises of why people want a thug like Trump, right? That we want a guy who says things that he doesn't even know what he's talking about, who talks like a bully. No, that wasn't somebody, that was not Jeb. Jeb was someone, not gonna be a street fighter in some, a debate in a debate where you have thirty seconds to respond. And that to me doesn't necessarily make some a terrible candidate. It means that in the way in which we host elections in this country, it's gonna be very difficult to win these things if substance matters. It's interesting to hear you say that because when it came to policy positions, I know I worked on them. If you went to the Jeb Bush website, we looked at the, the election and couldn't believe that we had such substance. We had policy p positions on every major issue. Trump had no policy positions on any issue, he had and to it be, didn't matter. He had to be able to respond to Trump in a public forum with decency. Which he did. And with strength, um, and in an articulate way, 
and he was not able to do that effectively. Not, over at, the not of at the time. debates. By the way, the last debate he did, and then he got creamed, and he pulled out, I thought, prematurely. However, Thane, no one who has seen you, heard you, watched you on JBS, seen you at the 90s, Figures Beat Y, read your novels, would have assumed you were not supporting Hillary Clinton or, in a you know, quirky way, um, Bernie Sanders. Or we again, would, where's the left of We would not have Bush. imagined <laughs> that you would have been, and I'm not critical yeah, at I all. Don't, I don't think you By are. By the way, I have, a real, I have real problems right now with Hillary Clinton, enormous problems with her. And Bernie Sanders to me, and I say this respectfully, it's going to sound not respe disrespectful. I thought it was a joke. But I would have thought you would have found some home in the Democratic Party. How did it happen that you didn't? Well, a few things. First of all, I want to say I supported Hillary in 2008 in, in the first election against Barack Obama. I wasn't supporting, I wasn't voting nor supporting Barack Obama. But that it sounded first like election. you voted for McCain. In the end, because there was no Hillary Clinton option, okay. I don't you know. You would have voted for Hillary. I'm sure I would have. Okay. Even, what, even what I said before about prisoner of war, I okay. just thought, I can't not vote against this president. Of, Barack Obama just wasn't experienced enough for me to vote for not to as vote. As much as you wanted philosophically I wanted, to see the first oh, African American. Yeah, I live in Harlem. You know, <laughs> uh, It mattered to me. It was very symbolic. And it was thrilling, wasn't it? Was it was absolutely Whether thrilling. you liked him, you didn't like him, absolutely it was thrilling, thrilling it was to thrilling. America. It was thrilling. It, was, yeah. it, 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 it gave, it gave a, the entire country a lift. Okay, but answer, answer Eric's question. Look, Where's you know, the left? it's very difficult. Look, I do think that no matter how often Jeb was put in a position to say that I'm the only true conservative in the race, he was not the most conservative one in the race. Uh, if anyone would have been the more moderate conservative, I don't even believe it would have been Kasich. I would have thought that in the end, it would have been Jeb. And I believe that. And I would have worked for Jeb. I would have gone to Washington with him. Okay. I really Is this because he was a friend of yours? No, not entirely. Although I think it, it matters when you know someone well enough, especially now in which it's very hard to you know, measure it, personal integrity. You know, we don't trust any of these politicians. So if you happen to know one of them and, and you actually believe in them, it matters. But I, no, I really thought he was incredibly thoughtful. He was incredibly knowledgeable. I thought he had the, I thought the presidential ped pedigree mattered in our world. He did a tremendous job in Florida. Florida is a major state. It is, a, it is, we did complain about President Obama's lack of executive experience. And even what you said now, Cruz and Rubio certainly can't establish that, and Jeb really could. I thought that on many levels, although he wasn't on every issue for me, uh, perfect, but for what I wanted to see in a president, I thought he was by far the best candidate there. Okay, I want to now turn to the Republican side. And Sloan, let's put up on the screen the delegate count after Super Tuesday as it applies to the Democratic race. And obviously, Donald Trump is way out ahead. The Republican race. I'm sorry, yes, thank you. The Republican race with Donald Trump way out ahead with 292 delegates. Senator Ted Cruz of Texas is second with 188. Senator Rubio, Mark, um, Marco Rubio from Florida has 98 delegates. And then, this also surprised me, gentlemen, John Kasich has 23 delegates, and talk about an adult in the room, and talk about a man with experience, uh, and Kasich has done it both in Washington and as a governor of a major industrial American state. And over time, he's gotten more fluent when he speaks at the debates, and he makes cogent points at those debates, and he doesn't descend into a certain kind of high school playground discussion, you know, language, and he goes absolutely nowhere, nowhere in the polls. So first of all, what's your? Re we'll talk about Trump in a moment, but just reflect for one moment about about John Kasich and and the phenomenon, the negative experience he's had in the Republican field. He's he's an admirable man. He's a very religious man, by the way. Um, and uh, he took the Medicaid money that other Republican governments uh, did not take, uh, and in, in justifying that, he referred to his religious values, and what he said, in essence, was, I am not going to let 
people in my state go without health care because of some ideological partisan concerns that they don't care the least bit about. Did you respect that? I respect it very much. I wrote a piece for Time magazine in which I said he's a hero. Um, having, having said all that, he doesn't have a, pre a presidential demeanor. And that was important. It's always important. Um, he came across as a decent guy, um, but without sort of the gravitas, to uh, take an overused word, or the charisma, or those things that we associate That's in this celebrity-driven age perceptive uh, with the presidency. Do you agree? And exactly why I supported Jeb Bush, because I did think that he did have the gravitas and the pe presidential pedigree and demeanor. Nobody's interested in smart people. We're not. We're interested in entertainment. We're interested in sound bites. We're interested in, in, in thinking about the election like we think about professional wrestling, the same kind of, you know, uh, you know, the kind of dumbing down of a broader culture. And so when you say, look at Kasich, uh, admirable, smart guy, ran a major state, and I'm thinking, in this election, he's unqualified. Mm -hmm. He's not entertaining. He's not a bully. He doesn't say outlandish things. He doesn't insult anybody. And he's experienced, and experience doesn't matter. Have you met any Jews who tell you they're going to vote for Trump? No. Have you met any Jews who tell you they're going to vote for Trump? No. I meet Jews all the time who tell me they're going to vote for Trump. Um, when you just travel in different circles. It, evidently. Right? <laughs> evidently. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, when I was, uh, you know, I was, again, very involved in Jeb's campaign, and there were, as we know, there was, some, there was definitely Wall Street and real estate money that was part of the Right to Rise pact, for sure. And some of that money was Jewish people. Uh, and I can tell you that at some of these breakfasts that we all attended, every single one of the Jewish real estate people that were there said that they had been sued at least once by Donald Trump and that they had really, you know, feelings of utter contempt for the man. So, again, it, it, circles would matter in this yes, case. And, and I'm sure. In certain circles, the people on Wall Street have no feelings for him. Okay. Uh, no, that's true, by the way, which makes him very popular. Exactly. Uh, for a rich guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, did the ad hominem arguments against Barack Obama ever bother you? Delivered by people all of... Who, people who didn't like him. No, you know... Look, you know, I think you treat your president with respect. Did they bother you? Yes. Were you critical of them? Yes. Were you? Absolutely. Okay. Why are you willing to do ad hominem against Trump? Well, he's not the president of the United States. You mean if he's president, you'll stop? No. <laughs> okay. Would but I'm you, just saying that that I'm just gonna, shows you the, I'm, the I'm, absurdity of his candidacy. No, that's a no, double standard. No, right. no, no, you're, no you're, I'm saying this. I think that there are things you can say that are legitimate criticisms of Donald Trump. To tell me he's a thug, which is the word you used, I hear demagogue. By the way, many people thought Barack Obama was a demagogue and still is a demagogue. I don't think the media, and I don't think critics of Trump, fairly criticize him. But having said that, obviously both of you, I guess, are in the camp of it would be a disaster. But there's another. Am I, it would be a disaster if Trump were A, nominated, or a disaster of amazing proportion if he were elected. Have I described you properly? If elected, yes. Uh, if elected, it I think would be it, a disaster. I think based on all that we know now, it would be a disaster for the country and the world. Because? Because of the substantive positions that he has put forward that are an affront to the American tradition, that are an affront to the Constitution, that are an affront to our most basic values. This, this is a man um, who is giving the American people targets to hate. No Muslims are to be permitted in. I don't think he hates Muslims. No. When you say that no Muslims are going well, to be allowed I'll, into I'll, our I country, will I will explain whether, to you whether, what he means. He never means he hates Muslims. By the way, he has said over and over again, it's not against Muslims in particular. He hires Muslims. What he's, what he, after Paris and then San Bernardino, 
he reflected something that many Americans feel, fear. Yeah. And what he said was, at the moment, we have a government, we have an administration, which will not even use the term Islamic terrorism. And we are at the moment considering letting people in from Syria who are likely to include al-Qaeda operatives. And until we understand how to handle this, the government should take some kind of action. Now, do I think it was hyperbole? Absolutely. Do I think he hates Muslims? Not at he all. Promotes not, he promotes It's not hate. Leadership has, comes with responsibilities. If um, it were to have been said, as it was, you have uh, radical Jews who came here who were communists and who were socialists and who preached the overthrow of the government, and therefore all Jews were to be banned from America, Let's say that that were a political position um, that we were to we heard at the early part of the 20th century, which it was, by the way. There were there were people who made that claim. Uh, would you have responded in the way in a way similar to what we just heard about Muslims by saying there's a real problem here? There are radicals. There are people who advocate the overthrow of the government. Until we've resolved that, this is a way of giving expression to that. And the answer is you would have responded with outrage. And you would have said you're characterizing all Jews in a way that's unfair and is in inaccurate. That would, I, I want to suggest, that would have been your response. And I want to suggest there's no real difference here uh, in the case of Muslims and what Donald Trump is saying. I understand. And by the way, don't get me wrong. I'm not for the, po <laughs> I'm not for the policy. I'm not for, I, I think the policy, he was wrong. He also, was, as, as he was foreign, absolutely wrong. The question is, as a matter is, of foreign policy, does it, it's, it's a disaster. Does too, he how, by the way, I'm not sure that's true. But he's you're not, strengthening the hand of every jihadist around the no, world. No, you're not. That's a, that is a silly, ridiculous no, argument. I don't think so. he, jihadists hate America because of what America is, having nothing to do with what, what Donald Trump says, having nothing to do with Guantanamo Bay. They hate us because we exist. And they're going to hate us no matter what you, you close one, one Guantanamo Bay, they're still going to hate us. You don't have Donald Trump as president, they're still going to hate us. Their recruiting efforts uh, can only benefit by an American there position no that evidence. says there, no Muslims can, will no be permitted in this country. There's no evidence of that at all. Under any circumstances, it is a <laughs> foolish policy which leads to a negative result, and it's contrary to our most fundamental values and to all that we've learned from our historical experience. By the way, there I don't disagree. But it's, I, what I disagree is he's teaching us to hate okay. and that he's a hater and that he hates all Mexicans. That's not the issue. And people who criticize him there don't understand where the real anger is or why Trump has had the kind of success he's had. He's had enormous success in the Republican Party. He's had success. Why has he had success? Yes, had, why, I want to hear he's this. He's had why? success because median family income today is lower than it was in the year 2000. Because if you're uh, an unskilled worker, your wages are down. If you're a skilled worker, at best your wages are stagnant. Because people are working hard and things aren't And why do they think uh, Trump getting, will, will change things? Well, first of all, they're, they're angry at the Republican Party, whatever, regardless of what is. Right, right. Uh, you know, the Republican Party, unfortunately, what is the, ma the, the major thrust of its economic platform over the course of the last several decades? I want to suggest to you that the major thrust is let's cut, ta let's cut taxes for rich people and the rest of us will benefit. Now, it's more sophisticated than that. <laughs> There are other aspects I acknowledge. They're free traders. They have been. I'm in favor of that. Trump no longer is. But this, this notion that cutting taxes is at the heart of their economic philosophy is something that doesn't work. And, and um, average Americans who've been voting Republican, those who have been voting Republican now for several decades because they identify with a variety of other positions they might have, are saying, this hasn't helped me. I'm angry. Why aren't they looking to my situation? Why aren't they doing something to, to help somebody who works hard to support his family? Okay, and so why would they move to Hillary Clinton rather than to Donald Trump? Well, good question. I mean, if they've been... At the moment, Democrats are voting for Trump. 
well, independents we'll are we'll, voting for Trump. We'll, we'll, well see. All, all I know, I'm all, talking about on the Republican okay. side. All, all I know, um, yeah, Democrats uh, are crossing over and voting for Trump. I mean, we'll see. Look, I think, just, um, I think Hillary... Way, I, I, you know, there was an excitement when Barack Obama run, uh, was running for president, and he galvanized a segment of the American population which hadn't been voting before, and he excited young people. And there was an enormous increase in, of interest in the Democratic Party during the candidacy of, Don, of um, Barack Obama. What is also just striking, and I want to put these numbers up on the screen as well. Uh, so I'll put up the numbers of what happened in Super Tuesday in terms of the party. And these are the numbers, gentlemen. Um, in 2008, when Barack Obama first ran, 8.2 million Democrats came out to vote. 8.2. And only 5 million Republicans came out to vote. In 2016, while only 5 million Republicans came out in 2008, 8.3 million came out to vote Republican so that the, the entire dynamic has flipped 180 yeah, degrees. The other side to that. First of all, I accept that. And in addition, what I also found, this shocked me because, you know, I, I hear what all the experts are saying. So Donald Trump goes to Nevada. He wins undereducated. He wins college educated. He wins men. He wins women. And he gets 46% of the Latino vote. But. But. It's none of a but, but. This is, none of this was supposed to happen. And it suggests that there is a wider appeal to Donald Trump than the experts and those who find him very objectionable are willing to acknowledge. A wider appeal or a deeper anger or both. And first of all, look, I'm, I'm not disputing those numbers. I don't think it's a given that Hillary will beat him. Uh, if you look at unfavorables, um, you know, are you viewed favorably or unfavorable? Yes. Hillary has high unfavorables. Yes. Trump has higher unfavorables. Yes, they both have dramatically uh, too high unfavorables. Right. They both do. That's what would be extraordinary <laughs> about election like this. <laughs> Two candidates right. with, with unfavorables. Yes. This, I don't know that that's ever happened before right. in, our, in our And in by our the history. way, you and I, all, we, all of us know, a, we're a long way to November. Right, we are. And the polls will change and attitudes will change. All right, you've, you've been patiently seeing this discussion with Eric. Yeah. What, you know, uh, I picked on you because you used the word thug. And I'm telling you that I meet Democrats all the time who tell me, sometime with embarrassment, I'm voting for Trump. But as you hear this discussion and as you think about Trump, what, what do you want our audience to hear? Well, if you, first of all, let's go back a little I, a bit. I, I completely agree with you when you said, when you challenged Eric about this idea that, you know, Trump's language about Muslims is a recruiting tool for ISIS. I completely agree with you. The, that just, there, it's demonstrably false. And the best example of that is Barack Obama. No American president in the history of the planet could have given more overtures to the Muslim world from his first days in office, his speech in Cairo, his New Year's greetings in Iran. Really, Iran, New Year's greetings every year, they took that as a sign of weakness. They didn't receive it the way you do on the faculty campuses, on the faculty lounge of the campus. They took him as, well, he's, he's giving us New Year's greeter, greetings. He's obviously a weak man. So. There's no evidence of that. You're quite right. The, the ISIS, I, ISIS is there, and Al Qaeda is there because they hate America. And I'm not sure. And but by the way, here's the irony of that. If anything, they would hate America more for Barack Obama's drone strikes. Um, the point on Trump's thuggishness. You know, I want my president to be presidential. Uh, I don't want. I don't want him to insult handicapped people and Mexicans, even if he doesn't mean it, what he's saying, the tone in which he's doing it, in the way in which he's doing it, to rally support. I don't want my president uh, making fun of John McCain. I mean, I want a president who conducts himself with dignity and honor and uh, mutual respect and connection. And that is not what a Trump presidency appears to look like. <laughs> Everything about him has been 
thuggish his entire career. I'm not, I'm not backing away from that. I think that anyone, at least for the love of God, at least let's call him what we know he is, that he cannot stop being. It may be that thuggish plays well now in America, and that's what we want. We want a guy that's against political correctness. We want a guy who's going to stand up to ISIS. We want a guy who talks tight, tough. He doesn't have any proposals. I find that argument much more both persuasive and substantive. You know, I find there are real reasons why people can be against Trump. And it also, it means that one is considering how in the world has he been so successful so far? Depth of the anger explains it. And many people, by the way, I've, I've read you know, interviews in newspapers, and repeatedly one hears people saying, I'm fed up, I need a way to protest, yes, yes. this is the way to do it. And it's a reflection on our, look, because as we've said, I share the anger and I, I share you know, the disgust with the political establishment, which is not listening, which is not listening, that I, I can understand this. I'm, I'm much more understanding of the American people than I am of a leader who is exploiting that in a dangerous way. By the way, you, have, when you say exploiting, you, you would touch a button in me. See, when you were do, doing content, I have no problem. Does Hillary Clinton exploit? All politicians exploit. Right. As long as we all understand that. Mm -hmm. It's not that Donald Trump exploits. They're all bums. He lost me at a very first uh, press conference when he announced his candidacy. And he talked about the Mexicans crossing the border. And, uh, and he said they're murderers and they're rapists. He didn't, those, well, he didn't say that. And he didn't, he didn't lose me at all. What he said was is that, that, in essence, coming across the border are, among those who are coming across illegally, murderers and rapists. Now, that is factually true. He never said all Mexicans are rapists. He never said all Mexicans are murderers. And those who want to be against him make it sound as if he is saying all Mexicans are. He has never said that. And there's a real problem, and one of the things that he tapped into is the extent to which there are people, and I don't experience it because we live in, in the upper northeast, but there are people who are living along the border who really feel the extent to which there has been illegal immigration and sanctuary cities is a horror, and I appreciate their concern. He's, well, I appreciate their concern, too. It's not as if it's not a difficult issue. His words were chosen carefully. He said them in such a way so that they were heard by the American people to mean that criminals are pouring across our border and that they were associated with Mexicans in general. That, that was, was not okay. a chance occurrence. I want to tell you what bothers me the most and see if it bothers you the most. And again, everybody has their button. I don't believe a man or a candidate who says, I don't know who David Duke is, and I'm not about to summarily condemn the KKK, Ku Klux Klan. I don't believe anybody who doesn't understand who David Duke is and who would for any length of time, even if it's only for one ABC interview, not condemn David Duke, white supremacy, and the KKK I don't understand how that person is qualified to be president of the United States. And if I could, and if I could, could explain away every other thing that this man has said, I don't see how you can explain that away. Yeah, we haven't and, gotten to that. And, and by the way, me, Eric and I do not object to this. You don't object to the KKK? No, I'm, I'm just saying we agree, <laughs> oh. we agree with you. Don't worry. We're, with, we're rooting you on. What, a, what about I'm neutral on the Israeli-Palestinian question? How come that hasn't come up? Yes, by the way, that bothers me too. I mean, I, you know, although, although he has said at the same time, in a way that I think is much more realistic, the Israelis have given, up, have given much more than they have given enormous amounts towards peace, and they're never given credit for it. The Palestinians are brought up to hate Jews, and at the same time, I would love to bring peace. And it seems to me that the, the way you do that is you walk into the negotiation room with the aura of being neutral. But it's clear to me where this man stands. 
on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. I think he's wrong programmatically, strategically, I think he's wrong. But I'm much more upset with other positions on the far left of the Democratic Party, on Israel. Bernie Sanders has said, I get my information from J Street. That, to me, is a horror. It's not clear to me how Hillary Clinton's going to be different than Barack Obama diplomatically making, their, you know, their, there should be distance between Israel and the United States on the diplomatic front, not on the military front, not on the intelligence front, but on the diplomatic it's front. It's out of her way, I believe, to distinguish herself and to move to the right generally on foreign policy. And What's she said about Israel? I haven't heard anything. Well, she's written a number of pieces. I know she had a, she had a piece in the the L.A. A Jewish Journal, which you should like out if you haven't. She wrote a piece for the Forward. Both were conservative oriented, very tough. I back Israel. Period. Kinds of pieces. And uh, so, if you want specifics, look at the look at the specifics. Okay. Any comment? Another reason I was supporting Jeb Bush, I thought that he's everything he said about Israel was both sincere and correct. And I think he didn't, again, maybe it's because it's easier as a Republican to take a very pro-Israel position. Um, but, uh, you know, the Democrat, I agree with you, the Democratic Party is, is of great concern uh, because a very uh, different set of precedents were, were commenced during these last eight years between the Democratic Party and Israel. Uh, uh, levels of distance, levels of detachment, uh, you know, avowed neutrality. You know, Barack Obama set a very different standard. And I think that if you were concerned about Israel, you could say, you know, uh, re understandably, although the Clintons have always been, you know, stalwart supporters of Israel, that there's some damage that was done between the, the, in the relationship between the Oval Office and, and Israel. And that uh, that's going to take a repair that I think would have been easier with some of these Republican candidates than another Democrat. Hillary has an excellent record. Uh, she's been engaged with these issues for a long time. I've said this before. If you look personally at her positions over the course of a quarter century, now it's always easy to find one statement here or there that's potentially problematic. Her, her record is is excellent. So in other words, uh, you can't disqualify Hillary because you're unhappy with Barack Obama. If you're unhappy with Barack Obama, that's a, a discussion we can have. Uh, her, her, uh, her, her uh, record is, uh, is excellent. And, you know, again, to compare her to Trump, um, somebody without a feel for foreign policy, without experience in foreign policy, um, somebody who has expressed sort of neo-isolationist sentiments, uh, somebody who doesn't want to get involved, uh, somebody who doesn't have a sophisticated view of, ha of dealing with the Middle East or with ISIS or all the... Or you know, knows where uh, it is. Or the multiplicity of problems that exist there. If you're going to take a risk here, it seems to me the risk is on, on somebody who comes in as an amateur uh, with minimal knowledge and minimal sophistication is likely to do a great deal of damage. And okay. what the point I said before about diplomacy, she's the Secretary of State. I mean, this is, you know, she was a former First Lady... This is a woman who knows how to talk to foreign leaders. I'm not sure that's true of Donald Trump. Yes, and I find all this, what you've said now, is the substantive issues that I believe should be discussed everywhere and all the time on the American media. This last question I, I want to come back to. What does it say to you about the American people that at the moment, again, I showed you what happened in the Super Tuesday, that the Republican Party came out with more voters, and many of them are new, and there's crossover, 8 point something million, more, uh, about 100,000 more than came out for Barack Obama during his 2008 run. What, what do you make of the excitement the American people are feeling about Donald Trump? What does it say to you about Americans? I, I suggested it earlier, and it's painful to say. There's a dumbing down of this country, and there is a lack of seriousness that we see. We've seen this in our reading habits, our, you know, the lack of dinner time okay. discussions. Are you We're therefore critical of those who support Donald Trump? Yes. On a personal level? Yes, absolutely. And do you feel that it is equivalent to those who have a different political orientation when they were critical of people who supported Barack Obama? Of course. Yeah. I it's mean, all the same. No, I think that, no, I think that... You understand? That I he's think not that, putting words in your mouth. Yeah, no, I think that, I, do, I think that, 
you know, I was not a big fan of the Obama presidency, okay, Amer- but oh, I am saying really, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, Ameri- but but I would say it was a form of even, dumbing down. Yeah, no, but I would say why was it not a form of dumbing down for Obama to dumbing down for Trump? You know, Barack Obama is a legit. <laughs> but why is it dumbing down? Why can't you? Why does it have to be about being dumb? Were people dumb to vote for Barack Obama? By the way, there are many people who really thought Barack, Barack Obama was trying to appeal to our higher Barack angels. Oba- it's do you, a very do you different standard. understand how many people are upset with Barack Obama? Yes. Do you understand how many people thought he was horrible but candidate? But what he represented. And he would have been, but the people who were against him, what would they say about you? What? Would they say, you know, the problem with Thane Rosenbaum, he was dumbing down if he's going to vote for Barack Obama. Yeah, but that wouldn't have been true of Barack Obama. Yeah. Barack Obama... And you don't and see no matter whether you like him or not, he appealed, being to our, he appealed to our better nature. Only and, if you and, agree with and him. And Donald Trump Only is not, is surely, okay. if he's... He, I, I, oh, okay, yeah, the yeah. American people are dumbing down. What no, do you say? absolutely not. I give them more credit than that. They're angry about their situation. They want America to improve. They're sick of government that doesn't work. They're sick of the fact that their wages are going down and the number of hours that they and their spouses are working are going up. Um, so why not vote for Ben Carson? Well, that's well because Ben, ben Carson is a joke. Right, but, and he has but, dropped but, out, but, by the way. Um, okay, but I'm saying before it, that. It's not clear to them that this is going to work, but having said that, they need to give expression to what they're feeling, and this is how they've chosen to do it. And while I may have chosen a different <laughs> way, I have a certain measure of sympathy for the sentiments that they're expressing. Yes. I don't think it's a matter of, of, of dumbing down at all. Okay. I, think it's a, I think it's a fairly sophisticated view to people who are looking at both parties and saying, I'm unhappy. Exactly. And this is how I'm going to express it. You've expressed my feelings more than Thane has. They could, okay. have, they, could have, they could have voted for Carly Fiorina. There were other options of people that didn't work in the Washington Political establishment. There no other, one took there's those. Something, no one there's took something their about. Seriously. There's something about the Trump candidacy yes, because that can, appeals. Because he seems as it. Number one, he has been successful in his world. Nobody was going to vote for Carly Fiorino. That's true. As if she was a success <laughs> on the level that Donald Trump has been a success, and that's one of the things he projects, and people have confidence in. I will tell you one more story. I'm I'm in an Uber, and I say to the driver. Have you been watching the election? He says to me, yes. I said, what do you think? He says, well, first of all, Donald, Donald Trump is a racist. And by the way, you know, I'm a Muslim from Egypt. He's a racist. And I said, well, and then we go through the other candidates, and every one of the candidates, there's something he likes about them, but there's something he doesn't like about each one of them. Hillary, you can't trust her. Blah, blah, blah. So I finally said, well, then who are you going to vote for? Who would you vote for? Donald Trump. I said, Donald Trump? You just told me he's a racist. I said, yes, but he's strong and he would be good for America. And uh, by the way, I'm Muslim here in America. He's not against me. Hmm. I'm saying that he has tapped into something that isn't about the dumbing down of America, even though it seems that the lack of his ability to ever specify a program and a policy. And that he's not, no one's demanding that he produce one. They demand it, but he never Where, answers. Where's the intelligence they, they of that? If that the looks media pretty been, dumb. The, the media, which says it should be policy driven, then holds debate after debate in which all they do is try to create a food fight. So the, the media is terrible. Look, Mark, here's a guy that ends, begins and ends every speech by saying the following thing. And we're not talking about dumb. We're going to win. We're going to win. America doesn't win anymore. Look, I, I've memorized it. It's really hard way, to remember. We're going to win. Hillary says America the exact doesn't going to win. Same this is thing. the exact. Hillary says the exact same thing. Bernie in says English, the, in a sentence. That, <laughs> in an actual okay, sentence. But just, just make the real distinction. Yeah, well, it's not that Trump I says we're going to win and the others don't. I want my they all say that. I want my president to be able to frame a sentence. Yes, and there are many people who don't care. That's right. They and don't that's care. that's the dumbing down what, of America. No, it is what... what Eric tried to explain. It has to do with how angry people are. Well, but they, you, can be you, dumb, are you can be dumb and angry at the no, same no, time. At, at the moment, it's, uh, you know, what was the movie where the guy, where Peter, whatever his name is, scre- screamed out the window? 
I met as hell. No, I'm I not going to take it anymore. I, 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 co I co-produced a documentary about the Sydney Lumet. That's a Sydney Lumet film. Network. What was the name of the film? Network. Network. Right. Patty Chayefsky wrote. Right. It. Say the line. Uh, I'm mad, mad as hell, hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah. Mm. And by the way, Trump says that for everybody. Um, it is not inconceivable to you he will win the nomination. Yes, I think he's he's. Uh, I uh, got a decent shot at the nomination. It's very interesting. The last two days I've watched all these commentators. Those who are part of the Republican Party, in one way or another, are all saying he isn't there, he's not going to go in with a majority, uh, somebody else will probably end up getting it, and all of those who have some measure of independence are saying Trump will probably win. And you? Will he probably likely get it? Uh, let me just say, I, I had hoped that Jeb would stay in because I was hoping for a, for a brokered convention. And I thought that, you know, I don't even know if that's where we're headed now, but I'm afraid to say that I think that it's inevitable that he will be the Democrat, he'll be the Republican. Well, he wouldn't survive a brokered convention, would he? I think probably not. If, no. he, if he does not go on with a majority, which is a possibility, he could, uh, uh, you know, emerge uh, uh, as, as the loser. What that would do to the Republican Party, I don't know. Okay. And could you imagine that more Americans would vote for him than Hillary Clinton? Uh, if you're asking me now, no. It's a horror story. But, you know, I, I'm, I, I, look, I started out working on that campaign and I was with what you just said before. Nobody in any of the rooms that we talked believed that Trump was anything other than a distraction. I'll tell you what I, the advice I gave, show you how wrong I was. I said, you want to keep Trump in the race as long as possible, because at least he deflects attention from Cruz and Rubio, who are talented politicians. They're, they're, they're smart. You know, Cruz clerked on the Supreme Court. We're forgetting some of the talent that was on that path, thinking, Trump's great. Let him, let, him, let him draft for you until the very end, then you pull out ahead. That turned out to be terrible advice, right? That Trump, everyone should have gone after Trump in the beginning. But that's because nobody believed that America would take him seriously. But if he runs in the national election? I am afraid to say that at this point, nothing would surprise me that we will, we will end up at an at a inauguration for President Trump. Okay. Since you think a brokered convention is possible in Cleveland, mm -hmm. and if he does that, he will not be nominated. Who would be nominated? Whether it would be Cruz or Rubio at this stage, I don't know. I mean, if you're asking me to... And what about Ryan? No. no you think it could be... You it. think it will be... And what about Romney? Absolutely not. Interesting. I think, uh, I think it would be Cruz or Rubio. And, uh, you know, now there's talk about they'll come together on a ticket, which I think is wildly improbable given okay. their respective And it won't be Kasich either? I do not think it will be Kasich. Okay. And would you be, would you be comfortable with a Rubio presidency? I know you wouldn't support it, but if he's president, would it be a disaster for America? No. If Cruz were president, would it be a disaster for America? Uh, probably. Are you more afraid of Trump or Cruz? I am very much afraid of both of them. Are you afraid of one more than the other? Yes, Trump. Interesting. All right. And are you afraid of Clinton? No, of no. course not. I, no. I, would, I would be thrilled for uh, Hillary Clinton to become our okay. next president. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine that a Trump-Clinton election would not be a, a landslide for Clinton. And yet at the same time, I do recognize what you say this year has been so inexplicable and has taken turns that nobody could imagine that one has to have a degree of humility when one speaks about this. <laughs> I cannot thank the two of you enough. I love the discussion. We have both agreed and disagreed. We have. <laughs> in a lovely, lovely way. And, you know, we're meeting, everybody should understand because this will be replayed, we're meeting after Super Tuesday. So as the... Uh, the primary process continues, and we get closer to the general election. I have to have the both of you back, and you'll reflect upon what you said here today. And how, we wrong, and how wrong we were. <laughs> and, we, and, you, and, you, and Eric and I will be back. Yeah. <laughs> I thank the two of you very, very much. Thank I you, love Mark. you both. Those are the thoughts and observations and some prognostications of Thane Rosenbaum and Eric Yaffe. I hope they've given you much to think about. I said, what do you think? 
about the current primary campaigns. What do you think about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? As always, I invite you to share your thoughts. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I would love to read some of your thinking on JBS. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. Family. Education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.